and welcome back to Under the Moons. You like Lego? Well, so do I. Do you also like video games? <laughs> well, in that case, let's talk about the time when Lego and video games were just that and not Lego and video games plus an additional franchise. Let's go back to a more simpler time, the year 1997. Okay, well, maybe 1995 to start. LEGO were looking to dive into the video game market and after compiling a report on if this was a sensible option or not, it was deemed, and quote, a necessity, not an option. At this very same time, developer Mindscape were looking at creating a game that would pair a toy line with a new title. The two companies met at the 1995 New York Toy Fair and talks began with the announcement in January 1996 that LEGO would be entering the video game market with Mindscape. And this first game from LEGO was called LEGO Island. LEGO Island was to be a 3D open world title in which you found yourself on LEGO Island. To get a vibe of what kids wanted from a LEGO title, they created the island in real life to see how boys and girls interacted with this world. With the girls more interested in decorating the island and boys more inclined to play with the cars racing around the roads, the developers made sure to include the option to customise the trees and inhabitants, along with the inclusion of a range of activities like racing and, of course, a basic plot. A story trailer was shown off in early 1997, but it had little to do with the actual story of the finished game. Captain Click, the despicable, the notorious, the infamous. Ahoy, Captain Click! <laughs> this Captain Click antagonist was never seen in that final version, with the bad guy Roll going to the incarcerated Brickster, and Captain Click was never seen again. Anyway, the game came out in September 1997, and to avoid paying the 100 developers their bonus, Mindscape fired them all the day before release. Ooh. And then, to Mindscape's, well, I'm guessing surprise, the game sold really, really well. So, lots more money to just those five employees. But what about the game? Hello! On LEGO Island, you could play as five different characters. Well, kind of, but it was mainly about the adopted son of pizzeria owners Mama and Papa Briccolini, Pepperoni. Am I a rad ripper or what? I'm pretty sure that's Andy from Toy Story doing his voice. I'm a pizza delivery dude, the dude with the food. It's party time, Woody. As Peppa, you'd go about your day exploring the island and delivering pizzas, visiting all the crazy characters who had their own unique lines of dialogue, along with crazy sound effects to boot. No, you don't. On the other hand, if you don't want to do that, you should walk. And it's still hot. Papa, do you know why I call this my lucky pizza? Because it's really spicy. Glad you're here. I'm going to pieces as you can see it. Ah! Bricks are killing me. <laughs> so, here's what you do. Okay, now that switch will move the shell so you can... Gas her up and then she's ready to take up. The... Go! What are you Not over here? here. Ow. Ow. I'm already oh, here. I can't help hey. myself. You know those guys are going up there. They want to go up there. Good luck. As a 29-year-old revisiting LEGO Island, this game is f***ing annoying. I want to pull off all their stupid heads and throw them in a LEGO trash can. <laughs> One of the more admired and charming pieces from LEGO Island was its soundtrack that would change within proximity to certain locations. You had the information building theme. Police station. The garage. And the one most players put on a pedestal, the hospital theme. Honestly, just have a look at any YouTube video of this theme and you'll find comments covering anything from longings of childhood to getting rather emotional. A select group of now adults probably have this theme playing on in the background every time they accomplish some adulting. It seems like kids at the time really enjoyed this game and now have nothing but fond memories towards it. But kids are stupid and have terrible opinions. Like in this gameplay I'm using for all the footage, the player accidentally clicks out of their car and it just keeps going. All the while the poor chap tries to click back on it.
Another great example comes from the last level. When you fail to capture the Brickster, this plays. They said the developer crew was made up of a hundred people. You know, I don't care. I'm going to say it. I don't think those developers deserve that bonus. All right, okay, we're done. If I give this game any more attention, I'm going to lose my mind. I don't want to play with you anymore. With the success of Ireland, the Danish company thought, yes, let's pursue this, and created LEGO Media. And with that division in place, they greenlit three more games to come out the following year. And first on the tracks, which I don't know if that's a phrase, but it suits the next one, was Lego Loco, developed by Intelligent Games. This was their version of a city simulation, well, a more simplified version with an emphasis on the train system. The original intention was to decorate your desktop with little Lego trains. But when they stopped and remembered their target audience was kids, and not 47 year old men with an unhealthy obsession towards the 1960s BREV star, they began to build a world for these trains to inhabit, along with minifigures and buildings and whatnot, and it was your job to keep everything moving and everyone happy. And if you wanted to check on individual minifigures, you could. You click on them and get a soundbite to indicate their mood. <laughs> <laughs> you could even click on the buildings and find out their mood. One fun feature was the ability to send a postcard to a friend via the post office. Using a selection of stickers, you could create some rather diverse images. Yet back in the day, I could never end up figuring out how to send one of these postcards to a friend who also had Lego Loco. But you could still receive emails from in-game NPCs like Santa Claus or strange superhero bunny thing. So yeah, I could send stuff to them. While the basics of the game were rather small, Loco had a lot of hidden secrets. For instance, changing the computer's calendar would give your world a Christmas theme, or Halloween. You could create a space shuttle by placing two satellites next to each other. And then something I found out is when you click and drag all the minifigures onto the launch pad, the rocket would take off into space. The main character of the Station Master would change to his alter ego of the Super Station Master in a 1 in 10 chance of passing a phone booth. Place four fountains together and you, you get the bigger fountain. Ooh, a rainbow. Place a radar next to your average looking office and you've got a big robot. Although its arms are cut off because the artwork didn't fit into the sprite. Thinking about it, a lot of the fun from Logo came from trying to figure out these secrets. Although one mystery that still haunts me to this day is, how do I get that footbridge? It's on the box art. It's in the opening cutscene. Yet it was nowhere to be found. And I think a mystery, or even a mystery box, is a good way of describing Loco. Looking back, I realise a lot of this game was figuring out how to play it, and it was a bit of a trial and error, as there was no easy tutorial that lets you know what all the non-text labelled buttons do. But the biggest mystery, forget the footbridge, the biggest mystery is, why did the train in the intro continue to run down the two minifigs on the handcar? Hang on a second. Enhance that frame. 
It's the dude with the food! Pippa! How'd you know it was me? With LEGO Media's next game, it became clear what the LEGO group were aiming to do. It was clear they wanted to create a LEGO version of each corner of the video game market. And the next corner was chess. So the more interesting thing to talk about with this one is the presentation as well. I don't think I need to talk about the mechanics of chess. We start with the menu in which we're greeted by the king. Uh, we know he's the king because he tells us he's the king. Hi, I'm the king. Yep, one of those authentic American kings. All right, we're expecting some castle themed chess games. Going into the story mode and oh, it looks like it's a, a Western theme. All right then. A simple story of you chasing down some bandits are thrown over three chess games increasing in difficulty. The fun aspect, as we all know it's not coming from playing chess, is the character models and the cutscenes that play when one piece captures the other. Each scene plays out like a Looney Tunes cartoon in which one piece tries to outdo the other slash take them out in a comedic way. Mostly it's the losing piece getting their comeuppance. At the time, the LEGO group were very much still stuck to their no violence policy, and this was a very key aspect going into their games. So even though minifigs held guns, swords and all that, it was never used as a means to defeat another piece. Instead we got getting spooked and trumpet laughs. In total there were 30 unique animations for every combination of moves, and that doubled to 60 with a simple palette swap. Once you'd finished the three games and captured the notorious Thompson gang, you were able to see what cutscenes you had yet to unlock. But that wasn't it from the story mode, you could go back to the menu and select the next set of stories, even though there was no prompt to let you know you had unlocked it or a clear way of selecting it. Yeah, just, just click on the image of the already selected game. So you're back on another three game story and this time, oh look, uh, our old friend Captain Click is back. Ahoy, Captain Click. So this was the same kind of thing, but now pirates. Another 30 unique cutscenes to unlock and boom, you've captured Captain Roger. Well, he stick to the name this time. And yeah, that was it from the story. Yep, no castle themed games. So yeah, rather interesting choice of having the king from the castle line of Lego sets be your guide without letting you play the castle theme. What about tutorials? Well, unlike Loco, Lego Chess went hard when letting you know how to play their game. The King talks you through all the aspects of chess and it's a rather decent intro to the game. I'll show you what's what and who's who and how to be a winner in chess. The hippest, most happening, coolest game in the universe. But it gets a bit weird when he starts spouting things like Thanks a lot, sugar blown. Getting past the first tutorial book, you then go into the second book that gets more and more detailed until you're learning quite advanced chess maneuvers. So advanced that the tutorials start ignoring the conventional rules of chess and start placing all sorts of pieces on the board, like two kings. I think the American chess king likes to play a bit dirty, but exactly how dirty? If I let you see this book, you gotta promise not to tell nobody what's in it. That's nobody. Not your best friend, not your best friend's cat, nobody. Because there's things here I don't even let my lovely queen see. Give to me, Thanks, Sugar um, You could also play quick games of chess in which I guess you could select the castle theme to play as, except the pieces weren't as detailed as the western or pirate sets. You could also change the difficulty so you could go against some rather tough AI. So in terms of chess, this game did sort of cover it all whilst being a great introduction to chess for kids. Do my eyes deceive me? Ray tracing? But to, to, to bring it back from that for a second, let's talk about bugs because this game did like to crash any chance it could. Oh, you about to take the queen? Tough luck! The final cutscene's about to unlock. And if the idea of your game just cutting wasn't stressful enough, you could also bump into a sound glitch, which would be you know, the best thing to listen to when you're trying to concentrate on chess. Yeah, when you start to notice the cracks, the game seems a bit rough in most places. All right, let's hop over to the next one and hope it's a bit more stable and isn't just a Lego paint job. With Lego Creator, the key aspect of Lego was center stage, and that was giving the player the ability to create their own Lego models. It's a spaceship. But the main focus was on building your own Lego city. In three dimensional space.
You could choose from a range of LEGO City sets that would load into the world and could be placed wherever you like. Sort of like Loco, but kind of on a smaller scale. Mainly due to the program not being able to deal with that many sets in one place. So less like creating a city or more of a collection of buildings. Roads could be laid along with decorative objects and of course minifigures. These little suckers could be customized, controlled, and if you got crafty with the game files, you could change what they say. <laughs> I didn't like the second Lego movie. But like I mentioned before, developers Superscape and Lego Media wanted to go beyond just placing pre-built assets of buildings into the game. They wanted you to create whatever you wanted to out of digital Lego. In Creator, you could build with a total of 114 individual bricks. really loud. And that's just sticking to one colour as you could change most of them into 21 different colours. 28 of these bricks were called action bricks. These magical bits of digital plastic would have special abilities once you turn the world from build to play. You had bricks that lit up and flashed, hinges that moved on their own. Pizza and coffee that disappeared when you clicked on it. And the controversial dynamite. Apparently the inclusion of the dynamite was a hot topic when developing the game as it clashed with the LEGO Group's stance of non-violence. However, due to the game's theme keeping inside of the world of LEGO as a toy, it was deemed a fun tool and went down very well with test audiences. Although I'm going to have to put a disclaimer on all of that last part as I remember reading this not too long ago, but now I can't find anything on it, so that might not have happened. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time past. But it's still an interesting look at the history of the LEGO group getting more and more relaxed with the LEGO on LEGO violence that we could then see in later series. But getting back to the dynamite brick, this thing was pretty powerful. In fact, do you remember those videos from YouTube from 10 years ago showing off the CryEngine's power with 10,000 explosive barrels? Interestingly, LEGO Creator was kind of early to the party. Thanks to running this off a modern day Mac via a virtual desktop, we can now splendor at the raw power of LEGO Creator's advanced physics engine. What you see in front of you is a tower full of LEGO bricks and a bunch of dynamite set to BOO! You thought one tower was impressive. How about triple? Alright, losing track again. Focus. Uh, yeah, Creator was quite an interesting and powerful piece of software for 1998. Being able to place objects into a 3D scene and interact with them, along with coming up with tools to control said camera and everything else, was pretty cool. Well, yeah, it was a bit clumsy with most of them. But these were truly the pioneers in the sandbox genre that now dominates with the likes of Minecraft and Roblox. And while the LEGO group did try to jump back into creating with digital bricks in LEGO worlds, it kind of got lost along the way. But if you did want to get your digital LEGO building kicks, the simply named Studio by Bricklink lets you explore the whole LEGO brick catalogue, allowing you to build all those ambitious models you'd never see on the store shelf. Funny enough, the iMac model from earlier was created on here as I couldn't find a pre-built model in the program's library. But thankfully, I found a step-by-step -step YouTube video. The basics of creating a digital LEGO world that comes alive at the click of a button, I would dare say a reimagined version of this would still sell all these years later. And while Creator does have a lot of charm to it, like Merlin the Wizard there to help you with any problems. Hi, what are you going to build today? Uh, Merlin the American Wizard. This is going to be a running thing, isn't it? It does still feel a little limited in the world of Lego. It was more for small creations or set pieces, uh, like this one that I would always build in my childhood. An observation deck for a test of an all-new aerial vehicle. The Flying Chair. Seriously, this was my go-to back in the day. I think you're even getting really detailed and making like a vending machine in the lobby. The cool thing was, if you made something, you could press this button, and a basic step-by-step -step guide to how you could create this model in the real world was printed out. The ambition was big with LEGO Creator, but in reality, yeah, you could hardly even build a city block before everything's just for some reason started moving sideways on its own. 
with all its problems and bugs. I've come to realize that for me at least, it was the beginner's guide to navigating 3D space on a flat screen, something I later on in life quickly clicked with. And that's Lego Creator. Could you tell I was rather fond of that one? Right, let's leave behind 1998 and move into 1999 with the last three games we're gonna look at. And first up that year was Lego Friends. I'm not talking about that one. No, you can't make me talk about that one. But I will talk about the next one. Lego Racers. <laughs> Developed by High Voltage Software, the blocky world joined the ranks of Crash Bandicoot, Pac-Man, Sonic, Little Big Planet, and many more to attempt a unique spin on the karting genre. But despite how innovative you get, roaming packs of chimps with a full sense of grandeur will still call it a Mario Kart clone. But on the topic of unique spins, LEGO Racer didn't just pull a LEGO chess and cover the genre in studded paint. No, they took the key concept of LEGO, create, and allowed you to create your own cart and minifig. It was surface level, but still a lot of fun. When it came to the cart, the brick selection would grow the further you progressed. So while you may start off with some lumpy abomination that no one would even give a sympathy vote for on LEGO Ideas, by the end of the campaign you could create some really nifty looking cars. Beyond this though, yeah, it was just a racer with studs. Speaking of studs, the level progression would see you go up against a cup boss. You'd race over four levels. Overall there were six cups, so 24 tracks. Well, no, really there were only 12 unique tracks and then mirrored halfway through the campaign in the run up to the final race. The cup bosses, that for no particular reason, I'll start with cup 2 and end on cup 1, were King Kahuka, Basil the Badlord, Johnny Thunder, Baron Von Baron, and Gypsy Moth. Who are we forgetting? Oh yeah, the first cup boss. Oh look, it's our, our old friend Captain Roger. Well, hang on a second. Captain Redbeard? All right, you know what? I'm just gonna go on Lego PD, wherever it's called, and figure out what the hell's going on. Oh, okay, well, at least, we're, at least we're on the right path now, Lego. So after you've destroyed all these cup hoarders and broken their race cars down for parts, you then take on Rocket Racer. Whoa, more raid racing! With all these cart racers comes the assortment of items you can drive through in hopes of using it to your advantage. With Mario Kart and others, you'd find yourself at the mercy of pole-based randomized item boxes. But in LEGO Racers, you had the option of collecting five different colored bricks. The blue brick would give you a time-based shield. The yellow brick would drop a splat of oil. The red brick would launch a cannon. And the green brick would give you a quick boost. Now, the really clever part, and what I think is the game's most innovative idea, is the inclusion of the white brick. Let's say you drive into a blue brick and then a white brick. Now your shield will last longer. And the more white bricks, the more advanced the colored brick would be. So the oil slick turns into a barrel of gunpowder, then a magnetic trap, and then the mummy's curse. That would see your cart go all over the place. The cannonball would turn into a grapple hook, a lightning wand, and then three guided missiles. But the green brick upgrades? That's what it was really about. <laughs> oh yeah. A simple turbo boost, a double turbo boost, flying turbo boost, but the three white bricks. Now that would give you the power to war. I've seen bullet pills. I've sat on a firework but nothing comes close to the satisfaction of activating a warp turbo boost. You disappear into another dimension and blast out the other side, sometimes into walls or other really unhelpful locations. So the races could really become a strategic battle in brick collection, as if you get hit by projectiles or bounce off some upgraded shield, you'd lose a white brick. All the while, you've also got to get used to the awful controls that dictate exactly how much you want to yank your car in any given direction. And with each boss car you claimed, you'd realize that their cart was much faster when driven. So much so that when you finally make it to Rocket Racer in a blue bugged out buggy, the race becomes a ridiculous sensory overload of arrow bashing and imagery inputs. Yeah, LEGO Racer was really popular at the time, which made sense because more players could play it. They had a Nintendo 64 version along with a PlayStation version. And they both gave you the same experience as the PC version. Well, maybe a little easier to steer with the N64's joystick than the thumb cows creating D-pad. 
and due to the Nintendo 64's lack of playing video files, the intro cutscenes all had to be created in engine. In fact, I'd probably be confident in saying that anybody over the age of 23 was more likely to have played LEGO Races over the other games. Before we move on, while researching and collecting footage for this video, I'd noticed something that I wondered was a drop concept for this game and was later on moved into LEGO Races 2. These opening animations for each LEGO game are usually made months in advance of the game's release as back then these animations took a good long while to make. In fact, LEGO Creators was released without one as the animation company missed its deadline. But in LEGO Racer's intro, everything on screen is seen in game, except for one part in which we see Rocket Racer pull up into a pit stop. A rather strange inclusion that takes up 17 seconds of the whole intro. So I wondered if the original plan was for your cart to lose its pieces when it got damaged and would slow it down, and you'd go into these pit stops to reclaim your bricks. And yeah, like I mentioned, this mechanic was presented in LEGO Racers 2, although I'm not sure it was ever a good idea, but that concept was on the better side of ideas when it came to LEGO Racers 2. Oi oi oi, what a strange game. Rocket Racer is suffering crippling depression from coming second, and the characters keep threatening you in really weird ways. Also, it looks like our nemesis Baron Von Baron is back, but now goes by Sam Stannister. Do they mean sinister? Yes, uh, yes they did. <laughs> also I love how this clear spelling mistake is now canon. Sam Sinister, formerly known as Sam Sanister. <laughs> but I think that's all there is to say about LEGO Racers, so let's move on to the last game of the 20th century. Oh, well this is where I pat myself on the back as I've already covered Rock Raiders. It was by far my favourite of the 90s LEGO games, so it has a video all to itself. So if you haven't already, scoot on over there and see me de-age by two years. F*** you Frozen Frenzy. So instead, let's talk about something additional to LEGO Rock Raiders, which is this fan project called Manic Miners. In the comment section of my Rock Raiders video, there's like at least five, six people like, check out Manic Miners, check out Manic Miners. I knew about Manic Miners, I just forgot to mention it in the video. But anyway, let's mention it here. Basically, it's a fan recreation of Rock Raiders, and a faithful recreation at that. Yes, it's a hell of a lot more beautiful to look at, but it's still got the same kind of textures and feel to it. A very faithful recreation. Right now, you can actually download and play Manic Miners for free. I think that's a good way of ending this, by looking at a fan recreation of one of these 90s games. They were beloved games, and, well, in the instance of Rock Raiders, still played by a lot of people. So sure, they have their problems, and for some that may tarnish treasured memories if they were to go back and replay some of these pioneers. But what we have is a collection of six games that brought LEGO into the digital realm in quite a charming way. An entry in several genres told the world that the studded playset's entry into this booming landscape was indeed a necessity. And sure enough, still to this day, LEGO walks hand in hand with this media. One could argue that the variety of what you can get from a LEGO game for the last 17 years has funneled down to their collectathon of studs and linear story levels, but it's not like they haven't tried to branch out to genres they once paved the way in. LEGO Creator had three sequels before disappearing, and having somewhat of a return in the form of the previously mentioned LEGO Worlds. Racer had its own sequel with a cancelled third entry before stumbling with side entries that took to scrubbing off the more lively LEGO themes and sticking to Technic. And even LEGO Island went on to release two sequels. Chess? Well, chess remained where it should with one game. But we never did see anything like Loco or LEGO Rock Raiders again. And I don't think we will see a return to this kind of creativity directly from LEGO for a long time. Although saying that, as of recent, LEGO has released a couple of trailers for games that seem to be breaking this trend. But due to the impact of these old games towards the kids who played them, their legacy is getting a new breath of fresh air with the likes of Manic Miners, whose developer has stated on the Bits and Bricks podcast that he'd love to take a crack at creating a proper sequel to the original LEGO Racers. This kind of passion only comes from something that's made a strong impact on someone, and for a lot of us, it was these early LEGO media games. But this is where this video ends. So until then, have yourself a lovely rest of the day and do consider subscribing. I've got a bunch of videos you can flick through and enjoy. But until then, I will see you next time under the moons. See you later.